Um, anyway, my name is John Hebert. I'm a physician um, around the Boston area. I became involved with the 9-11 Truth Movement about three years ago when a colleague of mine mentioned that the towers had been brought down. And I was pretty incredulous at first, but then I started sifting through much of the evidence and quickly came across the factual-based evidence and the forensic evidence of the day itself and Richard Gage's uh, presentations. Uh, and after that, it was, it was quite clear what was going on. And I, I would just add that no one, no one presents the hard evidence of 9-11 quite as well as Mr. Gage. He, he does an incredible job of presenting the facts of the day and allowing the very common sense conclusions to emerge. And, uh, there's really a lot of this that's common sense and based in logic, just rational thought. Mr. Gage, AIA, is a licensed architect. He's been practicing over 20 years in the San Francisco Bay Area. He's a member of the American Institute of Architects and the founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. There are now over 900 licensed architects and engineers uh, with, with, um, that, that fully support the effort of a uh, new investigation into 9-11. It's a nonprofit organization that seeks to educate um, citizens of our country and all over the world about the facts of 9-11, not speculation, not just ideas, but just what are the facts of 9-11. Uh, we're now just one month past the eighth anniversary of September 11th, 2001. It's, uh, it's been a remarkable year, 2009 saw the publication in a peer-reviewed journal of a very rigorously peer-reviewed scientific research project in which dust samples from ground zero were analyzed and not just the chemical trace of high explosives, military grade high explosives were found, but actually unreacted high explosives were found. This is not just a smoking gun. This is, this is hard evidence and virtually irrefutable evidence that a uh, controlled demolition is responsible for those buildings falling. So the information pours in, as we've seen in 2009, and Mr. Gage will present some of that to us, as well as the volume of information relating to the day itself that's been um, amassed by him and others um, from video testimony and personal accounts that are all a matter of, of the public record at this point. I would like to make the point that science lies at the core of 9-11 truth movement and that a lot of this is common sense and some of it is real science but every bit of it is understandable by everyone, and it doesn't take a lot to do it. It just takes looking at the facts, and sometimes it just takes one little trigger, as it was when my colleague mentioned that to me. So I would ask that maybe we could all be triggers for our friends and family and colleagues as well. Uh, just a few housekeeping points to make. Please sign in using the clipboards if you haven't already done so. Even just a name and an email address will plug you into the Greater Boston Alliance for 9-11 Truth and Justice, of which I am part, and all of you can be a part as well. Those clipboards will circulate around or you can find them afterward. Secondly, uh, questions and comments are welcome after uh, Mr. Gage's presentation. There are microphones set up or we can come find you with a microphone and we just ask that they be brief and to the point.
If you do have more extensive comments or questions, then please, by all means, join us for a gathering following the presentation, a, a two-minute walk down the street at a restaurant called Casablanca, where we have reserved a whole dining room. And uh, they've very graciously just kept the restaurant open for us afterward. Uh, so please come there to Casablanca Restaurant. It's uh, just down Church Street. It's located on Brattle Street, which is the T at the end of Church Street. Just walk to the end of Church Street and look across the street. You'll see the Casablanca Restaurant. Please come there after. You can uh, speak with Mr. Gage and other members of the Greater Boston Alliance for 9-11 Truth and Justice. Third, following um, uh, the presentation, we'll also be passing around a bucket or a couple of buckets and donations are greatly appreciated. They will uh, go toward putting on more presentations such as this. We'd actually like to have one in the spring as well with a number of speakers. Possibly uh, on the Harvard campus would be uh, one, one goal. And finally, could I please ask a quick show of hands for uh, how many people heard about this event uh, by the following means? One on a, a sign on your windshield. I see one, a couple, two or three. All right. That's interesting. Um, how about a poster that you saw posted somewhere up on a wall or a, somewhere publicly? Great. It looks like about 20 or so. Um, what about on the radio? Did anyone hear anything on the radio? Same number, about 15 maybe, 10 or 15. And the internet? Did any of this come through the web? Okay, a lot more. Um, finally, email. Did anyone receive a specific email about this? Okay, about the same number. Okay, great. Well, um, please. Cable, community cable TV. Thank you. Community cable TV. I put it on. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, um, please join me in welcoming Richard Gage. It's incredible to be here in this historic church where George Washington himself sat right here. I mean, you have to really take this into context and it's not easy. It's kind of like 9-11 in a way. It's a complete shift in perception. <clears throat> George Washington who fought for our freedom and since then, we've been very busy giving that freedom away. <clears throat> and so what we're doing tonight, as I think you'll come to agree with me, is fighting to restore that freedom uh, that George Washington uh, so fought so, so valiantly for and won. <clears throat> I think it's substantially the window, the light from the window that's uh, blocking out the screen rather than the house lights. What do you think, though? You've got a better perspective from, from back there. Let's give it a few minutes. How many of What? Okay. It'll be pitch black in here in an hour, but we can turn it back on again. Uh, could you handle that, Eric? Uh, the lights, and we'll, we'll turn them out. Well, good evening, friends. I'd like to thank you for your courage and your willingness to reconsider the very difficult subject of 9-11 and the destruction of the World Trade Center and its status of Joyful, sometimes quite difficult. <laughs> proven to be one of the most difficult, but not difficult in terms of reaching conclusions. <laughs> but difficult in terms of implications of those conclusions and finding people open-minded and willing enough to come and listen 
to the evidence that we and thousands of others have found since 9-11. How many of you were able to watch the National Geographic special in the last uh, month uh, that was presented? Uh, great. <laughs> well, um, guess what? AE 9-11 Truth was uh, poised and featured on the conspiracy side of the equation, uh, surprisingly enough. Opposite a series of highly questionable and very irrelevant uh, experiments that were not scientific whatsoever. Um, we spent many months ago over an hour highlighting all of the points of evidence that you're going to see tonight with National Geographic. And guess how much of that evidence was portrayed in this two hour special on National Geographic? Zero. None of it. This is a complete slam uh, against truth and science. And this is the challenge of truth in this age where 90% of the mainstream media is owned by four or five corporations. And of course that includes National Geographic, which is owned by Fox News. That's extremely important that we know the whole truth about this event, 9-11. After all, it served as the pretext for the invasion of two countries in which already over a million people have perished. And the loss of many of our hard-won freedoms that we used to cherish here in the United States, as well as instituting abhorrent policies of extraordinary rendition and torture. And the ensuing global war on terror which is draining the U.S. Treasury, uh, a significant factor in our current economic crisis. It also served to perpetuate and worsen other injustices in the Middle East, and as the pretext, again, for torture, which has harmed the United States' reputation around the world. The establishment of homeland security, draconian executive orders, as a pretext for the loss of many of our own cherished liberties here in the United States through recent legislation, such as the Patriot Act, the Military Commissions Act, and the forthcoming Senate Bill 1959, the illegal surveillance of U.S. citizens, and a host of other ills that we're suffering from as a nation. Now, all of this remains intact if we continue to ignore or sweep the truth about 9-11 underneath the rug of history. And only the truth about 9-11 will stop another 9-11-type attack from happening again. We must dedicate ourselves to finding out exactly what happened and why, and to bringing those actually responsible to justice. So these are among the many reasons that we must peer into this painful part of our recent history and re-examine the relatively new physical evidence from 9-11 that we've not seen in the mainstream media. As one of our mentors, Joe Princioto, points out, to identify the perpetrator, first know the crime. That's what we focus on tonight, the forensic evidence found at the crime scene and the eyewitness testimony. A little bit about me, I've been an architect uh, for over 20 years, I worked on numerous steel frame uh, fireproofed buildings, including these three and $10 million gymnasiums, the $120 million high school in California, and this $400 million project with uh, over a million square feet of retail parking structure and mid-rise office space. Altogether, over 1,200 ton, tons of fireproofed steel frame buildings. How many Americans, though, really want a new investigation of these events? Well, Time Magazine reports in a survey that over 36% do. Uh, fascinating. And they say it is a mainstream political reality, not a fringe phenomenon. And interestingly, a 2007 poll by Scripps Howard Ohio University finds that 16% of Americans believe that the Twin Towers were brought down by explosives, as opposed to the official story. Well, before we begin, let's find out where we are uh, in the room today, and let's take a poll. I'd like to know how many of us pretty much believe the official account where we have uh, planes impacting the buildings 
an ensuing explosion of jet fuel, which ignited office contents, uh, starting a fire which uh, caused structural weakening of the steel frame and an ensuing gravitational collapse down to the bottom. Haven't heard anything else? No reason to believe otherwise. How many of us are there? Uh, official story. Go like this, I'll count you. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Wonderful. And how many of us are unsure? You've heard a few things. You're here to find out uh, more. Let's, uh, let's see if you're unsure. Go, go like this. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. Thank you. And how many of us believe uh, already that the uh, Twin Towers were brought down by explosive control demolition? Uh, the overwhelming uh, majority of the rest of you. <laughs> okay, we'll, give you, we'll get a count uh, later and uh, do some subtraction and figure out what is going on, uh, how many of you guys there actually are. Um, well, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, declares that they found no evidence for explosive controlled demolition or explosives. And later they acknowledged, years later, that they never looked for it. How can you find what you're not looking for? Uh, in fact, thousands of architects, engineers, scientists, and others have looked for it, and it wasn't hard to find. We've been speaking about it in 30 cities, 12 American states, um, uh, across Europe, nine cities, and before the end of the year, we'll be in Australia, New Zealand, and Japan in a 14-city tour. Uh, it's, we're proud to be a part of the growing 9-11 truth movement, and, which is growing by millions every year. This is, uh, we, as a result, we have hundreds of architects and engineers uh, demanding a real investigation uh, of Congress. This is our petition. How many architects and architects do we have in the, in the uh, audience today? Architects. One. Just one. Two. Uh, how many engineers? They always outnumber us. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And how many normal people do we have? <laughs> yeah, thank God. It would be a sad world without you, let me assure you. But let's get something clear from the start. The vast growing number of architects and engineers from 9-11 Truth are not conspiracy theorists. We're building and technical professionals looking at the science-based forensic evidence uh, found in the destruction of these high-rises. With that in mind, we have a website. We have the bullet points of evidence on the right side, and you can uh, link to very important information, much of which is on uh, WTC7.net, uh, Jim Hoffman's excellent website. And on the left, you can go through, when you have more time, the detailed PowerPoint presentation, and you can also sign the petition, of course, uh, we have 6,000 people signed on to our petition total, so don't feel like you have to be an architect or engineer. There's categories for others as well. So 9-11, just the date itself, the sound of this, brings many of us back to that terror-filled morning where thousands of us uh, were killed, cultural icons destroyed. This is shock and awe to the American people that we have not seen in our history, really. The eight years since uh, may have given us a chance to step out from this trance that uh, really we were uh, placed in as a result of these shocking attacks. And the, the story that came down uh, as the official story was given to us when our minds were in this state of cognitive dissonance. And we, architects and engineers included, across the country, simply absorbed that as the truth from the experts. I didn't question the collapse of these buildings until this complete additional body of evidence was brought to my attention about four years later when I was driving down the road looking uh, on my way to a construction site observation hearing David Ray Griffin on the radio with uh, KPFA in Berkeley, Guns and Butter Show. Bonnie Faulkner was interviewing him. He was talking about the evidence that you're going to be seeing here today. I was flabbergasted. It was as, as if I was hit over the head with a two by four. Because what he was saying 
made logical sense as the evidence mounted, and I think you'll see that tonight. Uh, but it was in complete contradiction to what I had been told uh, on 9-11 and after by the experts. I'm going to ask you for your opinion at the end of this evidence to see if there's been any movement in your perception tonight as a result of seeing this evidence as there was in mine after seeing David Ray Griffin at the Oakland Grand Lake Theater that night. Let's begin with an overview of the events in the morning of 9-11. As we start off, get us started off on the same page, looking at the jet plane impacts, the collapses, and the development of this myth. We'll need sound, Eric. Hijacked and taken radically off course. Within an hour, two of the planes have flown into the enormous steel towers of the World Trade Center creating fires and eventually toppling them. Dazed by the news, the American public soon believed the fires in the towers had burned so hot they caused the steel frames of the buildings to give way. Developed, fed by official sources through the media to a bewildered audience. <laughs> Elements of the myth. The impact of the airplanes, gallons of burning jet fuel, steel melting, the buildings failing and suddenly imploding. In a mere 10 seconds, 110 stories hurtled earthward pulverizing into dust. Right from the start on the street itself, the official story was born. Come out of nowhere and just scream right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. The myth? Uh, why are you chuckling? Uh, could it be that this is a gentleman right off the street, uh, not in shock, apparently, like everybody else, using fairly objective language. I witnessed da, 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 uh, the first one interviewed by mainstream television, right off the street, who has the official story intact in a nutshell, uh, ready to give uh, to most of the American people. Uh, where did he get this story? Is he a... Is he a Fire protection engineer? What is he? Let's listen. Fled into the FEMA report and was echoed by the experts. It was the combination of the impact load doing great damage to the building, followed by the fire that caused collapse. This is Gene Corley. This is pretty much the official story as it's evolved. Um, where did he get this story? Oh, from the guy on the street, perhaps. Well, what we're going to do is take a look at what tools we have in the West for winnowing truth from error. It's called the scientific method. And it goes like this. We formulate a question first. How did the Twin Towers come down? Uh, they come down by fire and jet plane impacts. Uh, we then perform research. We do background observation. Uh, we uh, come up with a hypothesis. Uh, yeah, I think it came down by fire, but we test that hypothesis. We make uh, predictions based on that hypothesis, and we do experiments to verify the validity of that hypothesis. Scientifically controlled experiments. We're going to see how NIST uh, did these, uh, and FEMA, how they performed relative to this scientific method. So we analyze the results and we draw conclusions from those tests and that research. Now, if the hypothesis is corroborated, we report the results in an open, transparent manner so that other bodies can build on the, the body of evidence. And uh, if the hypothesis is not corroborated, we go back and come up with a new hypothesis. So we're going to follow this through uh, today and, and see how uh, the, the various hypotheses that we have uh, at least two of them, uh, controlled demolition being one that wasn't looked at at all 
by the official, those promoting the official story, and fire-induced collapse hypothesis. Let's proceed by gathering some data. Now, we have many different types of forces that destroy buildings. And fortunately, each of these has a very different and identifiable set of characteristics. So this is quite helpful for us in our pursuit of truth. Uh, fires, for instance, destroy buildings quite differently than controlled demolitions. Let's start with fires. Uh, fire, by its nature, is an organic process. It moves through a building every 20 minutes in a given area or so, burning out one area, leaving it to cool, and looking for fresh new fuel sources. So when a building does collapse due to fire, we have large, gradual deformations, and we have uh, asymmetrical falling. It falls to, the, falls to the path of least resistance. The building falls over. Uh, and by the way, never in a steel frame high-rise building, even though we have over a hundred examples of extremely hot, large, and much longer lasting fires than we have in, uh, the world, at the World Trade Center. But say in a wood frame building, uh, we would expect it to fall large, with large gradual deformations and fall over. How about steel buildings? How are they expected? to behave. Depends on their construction. In this test, done by British Steel in 1995, a large amount of typical office furniture was burned to see what would happen to the heavy steel beams that supported the ceiling. When steel is bare, when it heats up, uh, it uh, gets weaker. It's not that it melts in a fire. In fact, uh, the fires, normal fires, are not hot enough to melt steel. Even if you were, for example, to uh, use an unusual uh, fuel like uh, kerosene, you cannot achieve temperatures hot enough to melt steel. But what happens is it starts to lose its strength. And as it loses its strength, uh, it starts to sag. It, it becomes uh, softer and sags. It can no longer support the load. This was the largest test of its kind ever conducted. It showed how unprotected steel can be distorted even by a normal office fire. But as is typical in steel buildings, the structural beams only slowly and progressively warped and sagged. There was no chance of a sudden collapse. In over 20 years, um, I have not seen, until recently, a protected steel structure that has collapsed in a fire. Well, this is very helpful information as we build our body of research uh, supporting uh, the, 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 uh, the, the evidence of, of what happened here. So let's take a look at buildings that fall over due to natural processes. Uh, these particular buildings collapsed due to earthquake. We have what's recognizable as a building at the end of the collapse. The structural elements are not dismembered uh, completely from each other. The concrete is not pulverized to dust. Keep these things in mind. And this, uh, these buildings were destroyed by explosions. We have thick billowing and enormous clouds of pyroclastic-like dust, smoke, with, with, with pulverized concrete in, in train, in, in suspended in the air. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the expansion of the very hot gases from the explosives are producing a cauliflower-like formation uh, and, 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 and expanding these clouds very, very rapidly. We have witnesses that hear sounds of explosions. They see flashes of light. If we have these elements, we know we have explosions. Explosions are not a part of the official story of 9-11. Now, here is a classic controlled demolition. Fortunately, we have hundreds uh, of examples from all across the country to make our person because it's the most commonly used method to demolish high-rise buildings. Now, this is what a high-rise building looks like then while it's being demolished with explosives. And controlled demolitions can be engineered in many different ways, of course. Normally, the purpose of a controlled demolition is to remove a structure while avoiding damage to adjacent structures and to do so economically. 
So typically a tall building like this is demolished by placing thousands of cutter charges throughout the columns and beams in the building and then detonating them in a very precise order, uh, progressing outward and upward, synchronistically timed floor by floor. So destroying the interior columns allows the unsupported weight to pull the exterior inward. Destroying the building from the ground up allows the weight of the building to be harnessed to do much of the destruction. So the result is an implosion, producing a vertical, symmetrical collapse at free fall acceleration. The building is getting faster and faster along with the force of gravity as it d descends down to the ground, unimpeded by the thousands of tons of structural steel that were there previously to support it. It's broken up and it's ready for shipment as it falls into a consolidated rubble pile. Now this is a feat that only a handful of companies in the United States can accomplish, and which fire never has, of course. So let's take a look at some of the key characteristics of classic controlled demolition. First, we have a sudden onset of destruction at the base of the structure, a straight down symmetrical collapse into the building's own footprint, because demolition waves remove those column supports. This results in a free fall acceleration through what was the path of greatest resistance. We have a total dismemberment of the steel structure, broken up, ready for ship shipment and loading. We have minimal damage to adjacent structures. They have sound, we have witnesses that uh, hear sounds of explosions. They see flashes of light, enormous clouds of pulverized concrete, and sometimes squibs or isolated explosive ejections occurring maybe mistimed but at the wrong at, at floors that are not where most of the explosives are going off. And chemical evidence, of course, in the cutter charges at the base of the building, in the rubble. So all of this is direct evidence of explosive destruction. Now, fire can't accomplish any one of these features, let alone all ten of them. So if we have any one of them, we know we have explosive controlled demolition. If we have all ten of them, we can be really sure that we do. Now, especially if it's backed up by government documentation, which is really quite helpful, and we'll find that we actually might have some relative to the Twin Towers, I mean uh, the, the World Trade Center. Uh, ex expert corroboration, experts agree, yeah, it's a controlled demolition. What do you want? <laughs> it's, it's clear. We have foreknowledge, of course, of the destruction of the building. Uh, because these are planned months in advance. You don't just do this, say, in an afternoon. This is planned and it takes, uh, of course, dozens of people uh, months to place and plant these charges. And, of course, we have video documentation. All of this is proof, beyond a reasonable doubt, of uh, explosive controlled demolition. Well, let's just take a look and apply this set of data to Building 7 and see if it might be an explosive controlled demolition. Most people know nothing about World Trade Center Building 7. How many of you have never heard about World Trade Center Building 7? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven. Um, very helpful. Uh, so this was a 47-story skyscraper about a football field in length away from the Twin Towers. It was not hit by one of the airplanes on 9-11. So it's a very interesting and isolated controlled experiment, if you will, so that we can take a close look at. Uh, it was the third World Trade Center high-rise to collapse on 9-11. It was only dwarfed uh, relative to its adjacency to what was at one time uh, the highest buildings in the world. But easily it would be the highest building in most of our states. Here in the mess. So uh, let's take a look at its characteristics. It, it did sustain some damage uh, from the collapse uh, or the destruction of the North Tower earlier in the morning, and uh, it's still standing throughout the day, and it comes down at about 5:20 in the afternoon. Let's take a look and see if any of these typical characteristics apply to Building Seven. Starting with, is there a sudden onset of destruction? Uh, at the base of the building. Well, let's first listen to Daryl, a medical student uh, who was interviewed that evening on 9-11. We were watching the building actually because it was on fire, the uh, mobile floor, so the building was on fire, and uh, we were watching the building and there was a sound of like a cloud of thunder. Turned around, we were shocked to see that the building was, uh, uh, what looked like there was uh, a shockwave uh, ripping through 
building and the windows all uh, busted out by the uh, horrifying. And then, uh, you know, about a second later, the bus overcame out, and uh, the building followed after that. And uh, we saw the building crash down all the way to the ground. Uh, you know, we were shocked. What did he say? A sound of a clap of thunder, a windows busting out, a shockwave ripping through the building, and then the building coming down. Again and again, relative to these buildings, you're going to hear this sequence of events from the eyewitnesses that, uh, that hear or see this phenomenon and then see these buildings coming down. It's, it's very important. It's not like the buildings are, are collapsing and then creating all of this phenomenon. Uh, do we have a straight down symmetrical collapse into the building's footprint? Well, let's uh, see uh, our, perhaps our first look at Building 7's uh, demise, narrated by Dan Rather. What you see are high shots. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. It's amazing. A, a amazing, incredible picture work. For the third time today, Reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before. A building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by world place dynamite to knock it down. Well, that's very interesting. Now, Dan has never repeated those words, deliberately destroyed by world place dynamite to knock it down. He's using his intuition to describe what he thinks he's seeing. Uh, all of us have seen, many, most of us, these old hotels being destroyed in Las, Las, in, uh, Las Vegas. And, and so, uh, that's helpful, but we've never uh, seen Building 7, in fact, uh, come down with very rare exceptions on the mainstream media. After 9-11, what happened? What's the problem with showing the third worst structural failure in modern history to architects, engineers, and across America? This is extremely important, uh, an extremely important event in our history, after all. Let's take a look from West Street. Maybe we can get a little more perspective. Smooth, symmetrical, straight down. It's gone, man. Let's take one more look. Penthouse falls first in the case four column damage. Let's bring it back up. Watch that penthouse falling first. Very important information. Now we have an explanation, an official explanation from us for this particular uh, building. Uh, what we have is uh, eight to ten fires that NIST describes as being large and out of control. These are the worst fires that we have evidence for, video or photographic. Uh, they are. Uh, certainly fires, and they're occurring on the 7th floor, the 12th floor, and the 13th floor. Uh, so these are the fires on the 12th floor that are cited as being the cause of this building's demise. Problem is that uh, for the last hour of this building's life, those fires were out on the 12th floor as evidenced by the photograph. So what initiated that event? Well, here's the official story, we have column 79 fully engulfed outside these windows where we saw no fires burning, fully engulfed uh, according to the official story. And what happens uh, to this building? The official story sh pr provides uh, destruction by normal office fires with a new phenomenon never before seen in high-rise fires uh, where we have these long span beams uh, thermally uh, thermal expansion, it's called, and it uh, pushes this girder off of its seat on column 79, resulting in the collapse of that floor onto the floor below and successive floors up to nine floors, leaving this very stout column unbraced for nine floors, and then it buckles. And then this instability travels vertically, upward, downward, and horizontally at a very rapid pace in about 15 seconds. After that, we have the entire building coming down, as you saw. Uh, what's the problem here? Well, NIST uh, tries to explain this with a very sophisticated computer model. 
Here it is. What are we looking at? What are we seeing here? We're seeing a completely different behavior in this building than we saw in the videos. The videos show the building coming straight down without deformations. The computer model shows a complete deformation on the top, and as you'll see on the bottom as well. And what else is happening? The animation stops. They won't show us. It, uh, they collapse all the way down to the ground. Why? Because it's pretty obvious that this building would be tipping over, looking nothing like the video. Could that be the reason? What else do we see? 400 structural steel connections failing per second in this moment steel frame resisting building where the perimeter columns and beams are very rigidly welded to each other. We obviously would see, if this were the, the, the truth of what happened, large and gradual deformations in the perimeter steel frame system as the interior was caving in. But the computer model apparently has all of these members letting go uh, of their connections to each other so that we can uh, have some resemblance, perhaps, to uh, a six and a half second collapse of this building. These are large gradual deformations associated in the, near the bottom, which we don't see either in any of the videos. Let's take a second look, or another look, in comparison with a known controlled demolition on the right and building seven on the left. Is there any relationship between the, the destruction of these two buildings? Is there enough relationship to warrant a real investigation into the possible use of explosives? Did the building fall into its own footprint? Pretty much so. Uh, we have uh, very, very controlled, tight, uh, slightly overlapping the street. Uh, do we have demolition waves? Well, how do these demolition waves, how do we bring a building straight down into its own footprint? Uh, we have to remove the core columns, 24 of them in this case, within a fraction of a second of each other, and then synchronistically timed floor by floor. The question is, or any deviation from that pattern, the building will tip, and there are plenty of examples, horrific examples of De controlled demolitions gone wrong. Can fire create this level of precision? Do we have a free fall speed or acceleration of the building's collapse through the path of greatest resistance? Let's listen to uh, physics teacher David Chandler explain this to us and to this. To measure the downward acceleration of Building 7 by video frame analysis. Use the magnifying glass to place markers in the corner of the building on each frame. From this we can get a data table and various graphs. The slope of this graph indicates acceleration, which is shown here to be about minus 10.279 plus or minus 0.6. Free fall in a vacuum is minus 9.8 in these units. That falls within the margin of error of this measurement. In other words, the rate of fall of building seven in the first few seconds is indistinguishable from free fall in a vacuum. This is very important information because prior to this, NIST was claiming that it couldn't have been free fall because that would mean there'd be no structure underneath. So in their public press conference, David Chandler, Stephen Jones, and others pressed NIST about this point, documenting in this manner, that indeed it collapsed at free fall acceleration as fast as a brick falling off the top of the building for nearly the first 100 feet of this building's drop. Well, NIST comes back and they have to acknowledge, oh, you're right, it's free fall, all right, for that length of time, two and a, two and a quarter seconds. But they do not acknowledge the implications of that free fall, meaning the structure underneath had to have been removed, and could only have been removed explosively. Here's the building gaining downward momentum second by second, faster and faster, as fast as a brick falling off the top of the building, and that first was done on the site. Well, Dr. Jones performs x-ray dispersive spectroscopy on these, and what does he find? 
he finds the chemical evidence of thermite, ignited thermite in the sphere, aluminum, iron, sulfur, in many cases. Uh, and this, he does a controlled experiment uh, of his own. Uh, in this case, uh, um, John Perulis uh, brought in the spheres from a controlled experiment on uh, sulfur, iron, aluminum, oxygen, and manganese. This is uh, direct evidence of the fingerprint of thermite. Now, EPA finds these spheres. Dr. Jones didn't manufacture this evidence. It's found by the EPA, and it's USGS uh, on behalf of the EPA. It's, it's found in the dust analyzed by R.J. Lee uh, uh, that they were doing toxicological studies with on top of the Deutsche Bank building. They find the same chemical makeup. They don't, don't know what to make of this finding. They just kind of sweep it under the rug. This is evidence that has to be analyzed and provided to the American people, and it wasn't. Uh, manganese is also found in abundance on top of the Deutsche Bank building during these tox toxicological studies. The city's chief medical examiner is extremely concerned about, about this. Uh, it's, it's a complete hazard and has no business being there as a result of office fires or jet fuel fires for that matter. Now, Dr. Jones thinks carefully and he says, well, would there be any evidence of unexploded thermite in the dust? Any reverse engineer says, powders of aluminum, iron oxide, copper oxide, zinc nitrate, potassium permanganate must have been what the original unignited thermite would be made of. So he starts looking for this stuff, puts the magnet back to the dust. And all of these small chips come up to the magnet. He missed them. These are really small, a sixteenth of an inch long, this being the largest one. Uh, it's red on one side, gray on the other. The red side uh, is composed of some very interesting materials. Uh, we have uh, particles of aluminum, iron, oxygen, sulfur. Very interesting. Very similar to unignited thermite particles over here. Wow, this is disturbing. Uh, what's more disturbing is the size of those particles. Within this red layer, we have particles that are thousand times smaller than a human hair. Nano-sized particles, 42 nanometers across. Now this is documented over 10 years ago by Lawrence Livermore Lab, who developed it along with NIST. Very, very interesting. Uh, these particles are uh, perfectly rhomboidal in shape. The iron oxide particles, 42 nanometers across. Very uniform. The aluminum platelets are also very uniform at about the same size. These two <coughs> main ingredients of thermite are mixed perfectly in the one-third, two-thirds ratio. This stuff is not made in a cave in Afghanistan. It's developed only in the most sophisticated defense contracting laboratories. It's not available on the market whatsoever. <clears throat> and these spheres are found associated with the red-gray chips, which are partially ignited, indicating the source of those spheres is not from some other place as well. Now, this is all very carefully documented in a 27-page peer-reviewed paper in the Bentham Open Chemical Physics Journal. It's taken scientific circles by storm. People have quit and have been fired over this. It's quite a controversy, as you can well imagine, because it is proof of not just a smoking gun at the World Trade Center, but a loaded gun. In fact, Dr. Jones and a small team of scientists and independently verified uh, across the ocean in Denmark with Niels Herrick finds through EDS, XRF, 
and WDS, uh, given the unusual elements found in the combinations and proportions, along with 1,3-diphenylpropane in the air, that uh, this is uh, direct evidence uh, that thermite reaction compounds were deliberately placed in both World Trade Center towers and Building 7. This is all together direct evidence of explosive destruction. Fire can't account for any one of these elements, let alone all 10 of them in Building 7. Why? Well, high-rise buildings are protected with two or three hour fire protection and uh, designed to allow the people to exit the building safely uh, in, in case of, of any possible collapse. But even though these, uh, the ability of this fireproofing has been far exceeded in very hot, large, and long-lasting fires, uh, we have never had a collapse. Not in a six-hour fire burning over five floors in New York, a three-and-a-half-hour fire burning five, over five floors in Los Angeles, and a 18-hour uh, fire in over eight floors in Philadelphia. In Venezuela, we had a 17-hour fire burning over 26 floors. Not one of them has collapsed. Well, surely, this fully engulfed building will collapse, Building 5 at the World Trade Center, if any building was going to collapse due to fire or thermal expansion, uh, we would expect this one to do so. No? Uh, Mid-rise and high-rise steel frame protected buildings do not collapse due to fires. Well, wait, here's a big one. Beijing, February, fully engulfed. Uh, did this one collapse as a result? Uh, surely it must have. Um, it is uh, an unbelievable fire. Let's take a look and see. Nope, uh, fully uh, standing uh, just fine. We do not have any history of collapses due to fire. Uh, and yet, in, in this building, after burning for a couple of hours, uh, from about uh, 1 o'clock to 3, maybe 4 o'clock, uh, we have these uh, 8 to 10, what amounts to very small fires, and a whole lot of smoke on the south side, collapsing overall in just six and a half seconds. Something's wrong. Well, let's take a look at the FEMA report. Uh, we have four uh, building reports uh, that are available to us, uh, and starting with these volunteers from the American Society of Civil Engineers. These are not your average PTA volunteers, though. <laughs> these folks earn $10 million annually, uh, most of them, uh, with defense contracts, interestingly enough. Finally, though, we got some money uh, given to FEMA, and we'll see what FEMA did with that $600,000. But compare that to the $40 million it took to investigate the uh, relationship between Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. A complete misallocation of resources. Uh, Silverstein Weidlinger report came along with the NIST report to reverse the conclusions of the FEMA report, and they finally get $20 million of funding in three years. We'll see what they did with that. But let's just note, first of all, that we have all of these individuals working on these reports, and uh, it turns out that they work all the way through each of the reports, the FEMA report, the Wiley report, and the NIST report, in addition to helping popular mechanics come up with their ludicrous uh, debunking of the 9-11 truth movement. Um, so these are not independent reports by any means. Keep that in mind. But FEMA, in their wisdom, and I mean, Seriously, they came up with an analysis of the two pieces of steel that were saved from World Trade Center 7. Uh, and they document this very carefully in their Appendix C of the May of 2002 Building Performance Assessment Report. What did they find and document? Rapid oxidation, sulfidation, subsequent intergranular melting. This does not happen with normal office fires. Building 7, which this is the analysis for, was a normal office fire. There's a disconnect. There's cause for more investigation. Uh, sulfidation? Well, there was uh, calcium sulfite in the gypsum board, maybe for the first time in the 100-year history of using it as a protection for around steel. The sulfur somehow leached out and attacked the steel. No. Very unlikely. A sulfur formed during this hot corrosion attack on the steel. 
Well, John Field documents this sulfur. Uh, first responder, every time I tried to breathe in, it burned, the smell of sulfur and everything else. That smell haunts me, that sulfur burning. Where did it come from? We already noted that sulfur is added to thermite, making it thermate, which lowers the melting point of steel, making uh, it much more effective. Here is the documentation in Appendix C of the intergranular melting uh, of, iron, of iron invading the grain boundaries of the steel. Capable of turning a solid steel girder into Swiss cheese, they document. Like this former wide flange column found in the uh, Building 7 steel. This doesn't happen in office fires. Fire protection engineers, firefighters are extremely disturbed with this evidence. NIST scientific method, uh, if the data doesn't support your fire hypothesis, hide it. And that's what they did. They took this valuable critical analysis of the steel that FEMA did in their appendix C and they threw it out. It is not a part of the official record today. That's extremely disturbing for those of us who want to see a scientific evaluation of this evidence. Moreover, FEMA documents the specifics of the fires in World Trade Center 7 and how they caused the building to collapse remain unknown at this time. This is after $600,000 in a massive investigation lasting a year. They don't know how the building collapsed. Worse than that, they conclude our best hypothesis has only a low probability of occurrence. What, you don't think fire and random damage brought the building down? What do you do when your hypothesis is not corroborated by the evidence? You go back and you look for a new one. Is there enough evidence here to support the investigation, a, a real investigation of a different hypothesis? Explosive controlled demolition, perhaps. They say further research, investigation, and analysis are needed to resolve this issue. Unfortunately, though, for those hoping to resolve the issue, by the time the report came out in May of 2002, almost all of the steel had been sent to China for recycling by FEMA. Now that's disturbing. In fact, Bill Manning, the editor-in-chief of Fire Engineering Magazine, Fire Protection Engineers, cites crucial evidence that can answer many questions. It's on the slow boat to China, showing an astounding ignorance of government officials to the value of a thorough scientific investigation. The destruction and removal of evidence must stop immediately. What's supposed to happen when you have a collapse of a steel frame building and you want to know what caused it. Normally, uh, when you have a structural failure, uh, you carefully go through the debris field, uh, looking at each item, photographing every beam as it collapsed and every uh, column where it is in the ground, and you pick them up very carefully and you uh, look at each element. We were unable to do that in the case of Tower 7. Why not? Oh, all of the steel had been sent to China for recycling. This is very disturbing. A famous uh, scientific method, if the evidence contradicts the fire hypothesis, destroy it. 9-11 uh, Commission was tasked with explaining the full range of events relative to 9-11, but they don't even offer one sentence in their 571-page report regarding the destruction of the third worst structural failure in modern history, Building 7. Is this one of the reasons, perhaps, that Max Cleveland resigns from the commission, citing it's a national scandal? The investigation is now compromised. It's important to, yeah, could you turn the house lights on up, up, up above? Not the stage lights. It's important to remember, though, the conflicts of interest should be avoided, says the NFPA, in your investigation. Do we have any conflicts of interest? Well, here are the individuals uh, working on the NIST report and the FEMA report and uh, the Weidlinger report. Do they have any interests with the federal government or DOD? Oh, uh, yes, all of the major players, in fact, did. SAIC being one of them, major defense contractor, and ARA. In fact, these 
particular individuals were instrumental in developing nanothermite in the first place, uh, 10 years earlier, along with NIST. Why were they placed at the head of the investigation? Was it to lead the investigation away from the discovery, perhaps, of nanothermitic materials in the dust? This is documented by Kevin Ryan, the top 10 connections between NIST and nanothermite in the Journal of 911studies.com. An excellent read, along with Kevin Ryan's other excellent uh, articles there. Uh, Foreman Williams, one of the top developers of energetic materials and key contributor uh, in, with the NIST report. Uh, testimony from the first responders we discussed, uh, whistleblowers, uh, and expert corroboration. Well, here's Danny Jalenko, the 27-year controlled demolition expert uh, in uh, Holland. Uh, it starts from below, he says. They simply blow away the columns. It, it's controlled demolition. A team of experts did this. It's con uh, controlled, it's uh, professional work, without a doubt. Well, that's important information from a 27-year expert. Should he be listened to? Should there be an investigation of controlled demolition? Here's Hugo Bachman from the Swiss uh, Federal Institute of Technology, where he's chairman of the Department of Structural Dynamics. What does he say? In my opinion, World Trade Center 7 was with great probability professionally demolished. And we have 30 structural engineers signed on to the AE 9-11 Truth petition for a new investigation. One of them is Kamal Obey. He says, a localized failure in a steel frame building like World Trade Center 7 cannot cause a catastrophic collapse like a house of cards without a simultaneous and pattern loss of several of its columns at key locations within the building. This is something that fire is not really capable of. What does Jonathan Barnett say, and speaking of experts? We were surprised that Tower 7 collapsed. Uh, we being the team that investigated what occurred on that day. Thank you, we were as well. Do we have any foreknowledge of the destruction of Building 7? Let's listen to these mysterious construction workers and this police officer walking away from Building 7, caught on CNN television. explosion here. Let's listen once more. We start off with an explosion. The workers turn around and look back at the building and say, did you hear that? Keep your eye on that building. of him hearing those explosions. At the last few seconds, he took his hand off and you heard three, two, one. He's held back by these Red Cross officials to a line several blocks away from Building 7. They were moving everybody back out of an abundance of caution and the Red Cross worker has a radio. He takes his hand off. Kevin McPadden, here's this countdown. Do fires bring building down to countdowns? Here is um, the building, the BBC, announcing the collapse of this building 20 minutes before it happened. I kid you not, they apologized for this grievous error, citing the confusing events of the day. Does this make them psychic? What, what's going on here? Is there some sort of script that's, that's going around where the stories aren't quite lining up? This is very confusing. 
Listen to what CNN announces at 11.15 in the morning. In New York, Alan Don Frank joins us on the phone uh, in Lower Manhattan. Alan? Alan, it's just a... Uh... Two or three minutes ago, there was yet another uh, collapse or explosion. I'm now out of sight of this American has taken me in on Dwayne Street. But at a quarter to 11, there was another collapse or explosion following the 10.30 collapse of the second tower. And a firefighter who rushed by estimated that 50 stories went down. Uh, the street filled with smoke. It was like a fire, uh, forest fire pouring down a canyon. Now, as uh, I think Patty Sack and others have told you, all of Manhattan is covered in downtown. A 50 story building went down. There were no other 50 story buildings that went down uh, that day. Uh, what's going on here? We have the announcement uh, of this 50 story building that went down. Was it supposed to have gone down at, uh, at, uh, at uh, 10.45 in the morning, 15 minutes after the, the second collapse of the Twin Towers? Had it gone down at that time, it would have been completely obscured in the massive dust cloud that the Twin Towers produced. Uh, well, maybe, maybe that was the original idea. Maybe that's the reason for all of this confusion. A real investigation would get at the bottom of some of these things. Well, maybe we've shown direct evidence of explosive destruction. Again, fire not being able to produce any one of these uh, characteristics. And with additional corroborating evidence, uh, have we shown to you uh, so far, relative to Building 7, uh, proof of controlled demolition? Let me ask the same three questions, though, once again. How many of us pretty much believe the official story that these buildings came down by fire? Anybody? We have one, two, three, four, five. How many are unsure still? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. And how many believe the uh, hypothesis of explosive controlled demolition. Okay, the overwhelming majority of it. That's very helpful. Um, what we're going to do, unfortunately, is take a look at who was in this building and determine for ourselves how likely it would have been for Al-Qaeda uh, to have access to these buildings and to um, uh, and have, plan have had access to this uh, high-tech explosives as well. Uh, we have the CIA, uh, the Secret Service, uh, the IRS as a tenant in this building, and the Department of Defense, New York Mayor Giuliani's Office of Emergency Management, and the SEC, uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, probably unlikely. This had to have been one of the highest, secure, highly secure buildings uh, in the, uh, in, in, outside the Pentagon. And as clear as the evidence to the overwhelming majority of you uh, tonight is for the world trip for the Building 7, um, I'd like to suggest that it's even more clear relative to the Twin Towers. And so what we'd like to do is show that evidence to you, but we want to give you the opportunity to support the work uh, first of uh, the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth and the local Greater Boston Alliance for 9-11 Truth. If you agree with us that these are controlled demolitions and you want a new investigation, we're asking you to help us overcome the hurdles, therefore. So if our ushers could bring forward the four black boxes uh, that we have available for this purpose. Raise your hand, ushers. Raise your hands, ushers. Raise your hands. We would like to take, uh, give you the opportunity to, to donate at this time. And so please, uh, if you guys could find that, uh, those materials we're looking for. Um, so we have what some call the crowning achievement of the international style. Uh, and, and guys, uh, Al, we'll start, Al, Al, we'll start up front with the passing of these, uh, these boxes, and then we'll go to the back. Thank you so much. Um, uh, the crowning achievement of the international style, says uh, some architects, others like uh, Robert Stern cites, this is gigantic dumbness, right? We have the two tallest buildings in the world achieved by extruding two squares. Compare this to the elegant unfolding of the Empire State Building and its uh, beautiful Art Deco um, massing. Uh, it, it, there's no comparison. This was the tallest building up until that time in the world. Well. 
the engineering achievement was considerable. The, the American Society of Civil Engineers says this is the greatest contribution to engineering progress, in fact. So uh, why? Because now we have 60 feet of open office planning achieved by collecting the columns in the core structure and using a tube-type principle where the lateral forces of earthquake and wind are taken up by the exterior structure. Um, so let's take a look, in, in fact. Well, this, this is actually a structure within a structure. This uh, center portion is, is uh, incredibly strong, composed of 47 immense box columns, 52 inches by 16 inches. Uh, on the long edge, and almost that big on the short edge, uh, collected and integrated to each other with these 36 and 30 inch deep girders. Any collapsing of the relatively lighter weight trusses that are spanning between that core structure and the perimeter structure would have left uh, probably this, uh, per this uh, core structure standing 1,300 feet in the air. Somewhat like is illustrated here by the PBS uh, NOVA program uh, documenting, ironically, the official story, but accidentally exposing what probably would have happened, in fact, uh, leaving the, the interior core uh, unmolested. In fact, we have a 100,000 ton heat sink in these buildings, so this is the real reason that fires don't bring down high-rise buildings even long after the, the fire protection has virtually been fried. Uh, any uh, any 1800 degree fire would have been distributed, conducted away from the heat source. And that's the reason we haven't seen these come down. Well, we have jet planes uh, hitting these towers in the North Tower at 8.46 in the morning. It collapses about an hour and a half later. Uh, in the South Tower, we then have a collapse, uh, an impact at 9.03 in the morning with flights 175, and it collapses only an hour later. Compare these times to those long-lasting, hot, large fires that we have already reviewed. Well, the official story lauds and uh, praises the construction and engineering of this building because it survived the impacts rather well. What they suggest is that it was mainly the fires that weakened the steel to come down. Jet plane impacts had uh, relatively, uh, well, much less impact. So there's a theory that FEMA uh, comes up with, and that is the fact that these trusses sagged, and they pulled in, or they detached from the columns, and so we have uh, a pancaking collapse, which zippers around horizontally from truss connection to truss connection, uh, and uh, an ensuing pancaking collapse. We'll take a look for those pancakes later, but the problem with this theory is it blames the building for the release of the trusses to the perimeter columns, that connection, and that would be the building's fault. We can't have that because we wouldn't be able to collect the massive insurance payout uh, because it would be the fault of the building instead of the fire. So we have another theory by NIST and the Silverstein Weidlinger Report, which causes, uh, after the sagging, we have the pulling in of these perimeter columns, uh, blaming the persistence of that connection. So now it's the fire's fault uh, the, which is a result of the airplanes, which is a result of the hijackers, so we have terrorist insurance paying out $5.68 billion. Uh, that aside, we have a look now at the key points of evidence in the Twin Towers relative to controlled demolition. And there are several, if not all, of the points with some key differences, though, including the fact that we have uh, in... in uh, and a sudden impact, uh, or ex sudden destruction, but not at the base of the building, like in Building 7, a typical classic controlled demolition, but we have uh, a beginning of the destruction at the point of jet plane impacts. After all, we're talking about deceptive controlled demolitions, and we want to blame this one on the fire, so let's start the explosions there. In addition, uh, we have uh, and, and, and a symmetrical, symmetrical collapse straight down to the ground, but instead of an implosion, we have an explosive event where almost all of the debris is sent outside the building's footprint. 
And we'll take a look at that in a moment. Also, we have squibs, or these isolated explosive ejections occurring that we'll take a look at. And of course, we've already looked at the iron-rich microspheres, pools of molten iron, chemical evidence of thermite in them, and this nanothermite uh, uh, evidence, all of which, of course, applies to the Twin Towers. But let's begin and, and see if there isn't, in fact, a sudden onset of destruction, and what would have caused that at the point of jet plane impacts, uh, explosions, for which we would be looking for sounds of explosions heard by witnesses and sights of flashes.